So Luke chapter 1 and verse 26. In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin place to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favoured. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Don't be afraid, Mary. You've found favour with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I'm a virgin? And the angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who, is, who was said to be barren is in her sixth month. For nothing is impossible with God. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it be to me as you have said. And then the angel left her. I'm sure the conversation was a little bit different, but essentially that's the bones of what happened. And what we have in our passage is this picture of the giving and the receiving of unconditional love. And of course, as we're, as we're looking at this with hindsight, we know the bigger picture. You know, I was, I was looking at um, an illustration for unconditional love, and it was a story I read of Moses Mendelssohn. It was the father of the German composer. And uh, he was going to visit a family friend, <coughs> and they had this beautiful daughter. The problem was with Moses Mendelssohn was he was a hunchback. And so he was a bit unsightly. But his friend's daughter, Frumpji, she was a really pretty girl and he took a liking to her. And um, she was a little bit frightened by his appearance. And so on the last day of the visit, he went to a room to see her to say cheerio. And she was doing a sewing. And uh, when he walked in, she suddenly busied herself with a needlework and didn't really want to look at him. And he was saying, I can't say cheerio. And he, and he just asked the question, he said, do you, ever, do you believe that marriages are made in heaven? And she said, um, yes, I do. Do you? And he said, yeah, of course. He said, you see, in heaven, I believe that God says, this boy for that girl and this girl for that boy. He said, and when I was born, the Lord said, but I'm sorry to say that his wife will have a terrible hump on her back. And that moment I called out, Lord, that would be a tragedy for a girl to have to suffer that. Would you give me her hump instead? And she was so deeply moved, she offered her hand to him to kiss it, and she later became his wife. And from that union, that union came Mendelssohn, the great composer. That's what love is about, isn't it? And the application here, you see, is that God knows our handicap. He understands our sin. He knows what makes us undesirable and unworthy in his sight. And yet he is the one who is willing to bear all the ugliness so that we can be acceptable, beautiful children, bearing likeness to him whose beauty is more than skin deep. And last week we looked at love as well as we were considering the incarnation. We looked at the experience of Zechariah, the elderly priest who had been on the way spiritually for a long time. And how, in spite of everything, he and his wife had been faithful. The fact that she was barren, which was a bit of a shame to them. And you remember, because all, every, every Hebrew woman's desire was to be the progenitor of the, of the Messiah. And there wasn't going to be much chance of that. But they bore it well. And they were beautiful people. They were faithful people. And his whole life came to a climax in the temple when the angel Gabriel appeared to him and announced that he and his wife were going to have a child in their old age and he was going to be the forerunner of the Messiah. And you remember, he could have asked all sorts of questions and he doubted and those four words cost him 40 days of silence. And we finished last week, didn't we, with a brief glimpse of Elizabeth, his wife. Imagine what that must have been like when he arrived home. And the old gate going open and he walks in. She says, oh, Donna, how was it? He says, well, it's fine. <laughs> I mean, how do you say it's fine in sign language? I mean, if you're not practicing sign language. And then he has to explain to her the promise that the angel has given. And then, of course, eventually she falls pregnant. And we said last week, as we concluded, that she, con she secluded herself from the community with a mixture of Mixture of feelings, modesty, 
of devotion, maybe a little bit of embarrassment, but certainly there was a lot of joy there. And this seclusion would come to an end when Mary, her cousin, would visit. Now, in all of these events, we need to consider the purpose. What does God actually see in us anyway? Is our behaviour inevitable? Is this existence that we're living just a game that's being played out in the hope that we'll make the right decision somewhere along the line? Are we sort of wind-up toys that God winds up and lets us go and see what happens? Or maybe comes an occasion that makes us go in the right direction? They're very important questions for us to ask, you know. And sometimes we make really bad decisions. You know, I read a story of two men sitting in a pub. It was about 10 o'clock at night and the news came on. And they were watching, and then there was this, this, um, this article about this guy who was going to throw himself off a building in the town. And his friend said, to, one of said to his friend, I bet you a tenner he don't jump. And he says, I bet you a tenner he does. And he says, all right then. And sure enough, the bloke jumped. He went, oh, yeah. He says, no, I can't take your money. He says, I saw that in the six o'clock bulletin. <laughs> and he says, yeah, but so did I, but I didn't think he'd do it a second time. <laughs> See, that's a reflection, that's ridiculous, isn't it? But it's a reflection of decisions that we make, even when we know the facts of the decision, even though we, when we know it's wrong, we still do it. Because in the stupidity of our sin, we think for some reason we're going to gain from it. And so we can be forgiven for asking those questions, what does God see, see in us anyway? Is our behaviour, is it inevitable? Or is this just some kind of game, cruel game that God is playing with us? See, we can be forgiven for asking those questions because real life, for those concerned, particularly in our text here, was very, very hard. Many had left their faith. Many had given up, saying, well, God hasn't spoken. He obviously doesn't care anymore. But many stuck to it. And they would have been regarded as escapist and weak a people who were dreaming. And more than likely they felt weak and they felt unprepared. But that is the point of it all, isn't it? In the midst, in the midst of feeling weak and useless and knowing that God is speaking, but what can we do about it? Suddenly God moves and he moves in his own way, in his own time, through the weakness so that his people can learn to rely on him and have an attention span that listens and watches to perceive his will. Be still and know that I am God. But that waiting can take generations. It had been 400 years. And it seems incredible, doesn't it? That here we have God, the creator of the universe, intervening in the existence of very ordinary people. You know, it's a stuff of poetry. And sadly, the Christian church, for the most part, has romanticised this event so that we've lost sight of the characters involved. And so consequently, we miss the personal nature of our God. He is the one who, despite his power, despite his holiness, despite the sheer wonder of his person, expresses his love for us in such a simplistic and a beautiful way. And it almost threatens to overwhelm us even as we think about it. So here we have Mary, cousin of Elizabeth, living in Nazareth. And I want us to draw a little bit of a picture of what she must have been like. At 16, she's quite mature for her age. She's probably a devout girl, brought up in a good home. She was engaged to Joseph the carpenter. She's planned the wedding, are going ahead. It's an exciting time and she's really quite content in herself. And like most brides to be, she'd have ideas for the future. For example, what she was going to do with Joseph's bachelor pad. He was a little bit older than her, so he'd be stuck in his way. But she knew that woman's wiles and all that, she'll bring him round to sort of right thinking. And with the wedding fast approaching, there was so much to do. The tension was mounting and she could hardly contain herself. Everyone would come to visit the house, would talk about it. She'd go to the market, they'd talk about it. She'd go to the synagogue, they'd talk about the wedding because the weddings then, as they are now, were community affairs. It was six months or so after Zechariah had been struck dumb and everyone was still talking about that as well. We see the trouble is, it seems to Mary, is that folk are forever holding on what to what happened in the past. And like most young people, she was interested in the now. What is it now? Because young people don't think about life and death, do they? They just think about life. 
And of course, the nation's history was important. You know, the great stories of the deliverance from Egypt, they were needed now more than ever because living under Roman rule was just incredibly oppressive. And typically, everyone was so desperate that they latched onto anything. A poor old Zechariah and Elizabeth, they'd locked themselves away and no one had heard from them. And then one night, in the sixth month, Gabriel comes to Nazareth to a virgin pledge to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favoured. The Lord is with you. Now, from the outset, I think it's marvellous the way that the, the Gabriel just has this calm, composed atmosphere. He appears almost like someone who walks in the back door of the house, doesn't he? He doesn't flash up here. You know, he's not beamed in. It's not like Zechariah had. He stands there in the living room. And being highly favoured, he meant that she'd, be ch she'd been chosen by God to do something special. Now, like Zechariah, she startled, but unlike Zechariah, the situation and surroundings are really quite different. This wasn't a place she expected to see an angel, was in the living room of her parents' house. And then a response in verse 29. She says she's greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. I think the writer's using a bit of license there, actually. You know, oh, I wonder what kind of greeting this might be. There's an angel standing in front of you. More likely, it was, what have I done? You must have the wrong house. She's in a bit of a shock, isn't she? And then in 30 to 33, you've got to listen to these verses. But the angel said to her, don't be afraid, Mary. You found favour with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the, king, uh, over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. Very, very specific words and very, very important words, life-changing words, which she would actually be familiar with. Because there was a number of things happen here. You will have a son, Mary. Look with me at Isaiah chapter 7. Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son. And he will call him Emmanuel, God with us. She would know that. She wouldn't fully understand it. And certainly she wouldn't picture herself in prophecy. But who does? Do you see yourself in prophecy? We know that it's got a past, a present, and a future context, but actually it always happens to someone else, doesn't it? So you're going to have a son, and this son will be great. The son of the Most High will take up the throne of his father and his ancestor David. This was a familiar prophecy as well, something that will be read on a regular basis in the synagogue because of the political oppression. It comes from 2 Samuel chapter 7. And then his rule will not end. Now this is really the clincher. Not only was this child to be great, not only was he going to be the son of the Most High God, but his rule would last forever. Now for any woman about to be married, the thought of being blessed with children, oh, that's such a great encouragement. But the thought that he would be king, the thought that he would be the Messiah, it's almost, almost too much to take in all at once, isn't it? And sure she wanted children eventually, sure she wanted them to do well, but there was so much they wanted to do. Her and Joseph had plans, you see. But with her emotions shaken, her imagination running wild, she, know, she knows he's got the wrong house, and she's trying to back off from it. And so grasping the nettle in the only way a teenager knows how, she says, I'm a virgin. The wedding's not for a while. What will Joseph say? That really isn't possible. Thanks very much, but it's not going to happen. And I think it's interesting that she's not dumbstruck like Zechariah, but in Zechariah's case, he should have known better. In this case, what we've actually got, and let's get the context of this, all we've got is a slip of a girl who's got a life, of ahead, a life ahead of her with all the dreams of the future, but unbeknown to her, she's about to embark on this adventure that will make an impact not just on her time, but for eternity. Have you ever thought that our actions have an impact? It's like a rock in a pool, isn't it? And the ripples go out. And it's easy to demonstrate it like that. But actually, have we ever thought about what we do and how that's going to affect people in years to come? 
Now, although the answers she got didn't answer all her questions, it was actually sufficient to calm her. She understood that this was God's work. It would therefore be credited to God. He will be called the Son of God. He won't be called the Son of Joseph. And the poor lassie at this moment is trying to take everything in. There's confusion, there's bewilderment, there's anxiety, there's worry, there's all those things. But sensing, sensing all this, Gabriel turns around and says to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. And he starts explaining things to her. You see, God is sovereign. And he's able to do whatever he wants. And Mary had to learn that experience is not what happens to you. It's what you do with what happens to you that matters. Because nothing is impossible with God. You know, there's a stillness as Mary responds to the angel and accepts God's will for her life. And I think it's a mark of maturity beyond her, beyond her years, really. Being a willing servant meant much. And I think it's actually meant more than just the cursory reading suggests. But she took all those fears and confusions and she just strangled them. She knew that to become pregnant at this particular time before marriage to Joseph would be a painful criticism. She knew it could be even worse. If we looked in Deuteronomy, I'll read it to you. If a man is found sleeping with another man's wife, both the man who slept with her and the woman must die. You must purge the evil from Israel. If a man happens to meet in a town, a virgin, pledged to be married and he sleeps with her, you should take both of them out of the gate of the town and stone them to death. The girl, because she was in a town and did not scream for help, and the man, because he violated another man's wife. You must purge evil from among you. Now, let's put this in context. That would have existed in the Old Testament time, but under Roman rule, they couldn't exercise that. Okay? So she knew she'd become an outcast, but she knew she wouldn't die. Okay? You need to know that. But in this moment of submission for her, she places a whole being, by faith, into the hands of God. She didn't understand the full consequences of it, but she was willing to be obedient. And I think that's the step of faith and the application that we need to learn here. See, she was surprised, but she was submissive. But then there was a response. Mary's response, our response. See, all of us at some time or other feel that we're pretty insignificant. We do all the right things, don't we? We're moral. We care for our families. We go to church. We pray. In fact, we spend much time doing the right things, behaving in the right way, because that is often what's expected of us. In our passage, the angel Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God, is sent to Nazareth to speak to a young girl who is full of excitement for the sort of life that she thought she was going to have. She could never in her wildest dreams have imagined the events of that day and all the consequences that were coming, because Mary was just an ordinary kid. She had an ordinary life and of course we can assume she was devout in her belief in God and fully expected him to act and fulfill his promises. But we said that already, it was going to happen to someone else, wasn't it? Having accepted the commission from the angel, he knows that the message has sunk in and what does he do? He just leaves it. And I wonder actually what she did after he went. I wonder if she did what we do when we're alone and we feel so very unworthy, when we're alone in the presence of God. Where there is no need for our masks of false piety. When we feel very, very humble and maybe even ashamed of the fact that there is nothing about our lives that we can hide because God sees everything. Isn't it true that man looks in the outward appearance but God sees the heart? And that's such an uncomfortable place for every one of us. And I know by looks on your faces, I know you've been to that place. But that is the gracious hand of God. That is his heart that loves us because he loves us because he loves us because he's willing to accept us as we are. It's when God in those quiet moments says, I see you. And he welcomes you into his presence and our emptiness just exposes itself and so we just long to be free. But the habits, the careless thoughts, our bad stewardship, they all serve us and we feel like crying out, but Lord, look at me. How? Why do you want me when there's other people who are better suited? How can I serve you? And I believe this is how Mary felt. But nothing is impossible with God. That's why we're here. 
This is the grace and the power of God that intervenes into human history, that chooses the insignificant and draws ordinary folk like you or me into relationship to him and into his service. You know, I read a lovely story, actually. It's about a little girl called Mary. And uh, she had a hair lip, you know, and a cleft palate and a hair lip. She'd had it repaired and it had twisted her nose and everything. And she, she had a hearing that's gone in one ear. And she wouldn't, couldn't speak very well. And all the children at school would just take the mickey out of her. And it was in the 1950s. Um, and so she was regarded as different. And she was convinced, this little girl, that no one outside her family would love her. Until she went to Mrs. Leonard's class. And it wasn't unusual in the 1950s, um, and certainly 60s and 70s as well, the teachers used to do little tests for the children, you know, hearing tests and seeing tests, eye tests and all that sort of thing. And they had the whisper test, and Mary knew that the teacher was going to ask her to cover one ear, and she would speak a whisper, and she would actually have to repeat what she said, and then she would do the other ear. And so the time came for her to come and she didn't want to be different from anyone else. And so she went and stood by the door <coughs> and she covered, she covered a, a good ear, but she didn't cover it quite so she could actually hear. And she knew that the, um, <coughs> the test would be like, um, is the sky blue or what colour are your shoes, that kind of thing. So she knew the sort of thing that was going to be asked. And she listened and the teacher said, I wish you were my little girl. And that was the moment that little girl's life changed. I'm not going to tell you a whole story, but you see, this is the acceptance and the love that God gives to us, despite of us. For Mary, you see, her acceptance in her stillness, in submission to the will of God, in spite of her apprehension, in spite of her fear, in spite of her sense of unworthiness, causes her to rejoice. In fact, if you go to verse 46, we're not going to read it now, but she bursts into song. And there's a, re there's a reflection, isn't it, of Psalm 40. You know, he put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to God. You see, as a result of our salvation, we've got this new song in our heart that finds expression in our mouth. And she had found favour with God, not because of what she'd done in her life, but because of who she is. She's a member of the covenant people of God. And this is what we are today if we are Christian. And this is the point of Advent, the culmination of the promise of God. The whole world, and not just exclusively the Jews are adopted as the children of God. And so all the heritage of the history and the script of the scriptures belongs to every single person who accepts and receives Jesus Christ as their Savior. This diversity, you see, is meant to bring a beauty of the Christian church. It doesn't mean this running to our corners where we feel safe because there are people who are like-minded and they share the same label. But understanding the scriptures that say you are the sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you were baptized into Christ, have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seeds and heirs to the promise. It doesn't matter about your label. I love you, says God, because of you. And this word just explodes the myth that God can only use certain people. And instead it draws a clear picture of his grace, his undeserved, unmerited goodness and favour that accepts every single one of us as equal. You can look happy about that. You see how God sees us not for what we can offer him. Because we can't do him any favours. He sees us for what we can be. And like Mary, we need to be willing, useful vessels, willing to carry out his good purpose. And all that is, remains for us to say is, Lord, I am the Lord's servant. Do you know how hard that is? Of course you do. It's not easy, is it, to submit everything to him? It's not, every, it's not easy to put other things first. If we're willing to meet him at this point in our lives, you see, then... We will begin to see with the eye of faith the wonderful possibilities and the opportunities for the extension of his kingdom. So in conclusion, you know, Mary was surprised, but she was submissive. And secondly, there was a response. Now, we might have great plans for our lives. We might have, our, have a great plan for the future of our children. Everything is in place. 
The insurance policies are paid up. And these things themselves, you know, when we say we provide, that's not wrong. We must provide if we're to be honourable and good stewards. But we mustn't allow the guise of stewardship to cloud our judgment. Don't let the career, don't let the business deal, don't let your partner, don't let your family take pole position. Give that to God. Because you see, this is the point of the Christmas story. God intervening in his creation that has fallen away. A world that, is disregard, that has disregarded his love and his desire for relationship. A humanity that continues to miss the point of this wonderful arcane, in, in, incarnation.